today we're talking about the sovereignty of God, and there is at any given moment, as you bring up this topic of discussion, um, landmines all around. Either landmines that I can step on from up here, or landmines that you can step on as you receive the message. So I plead for your prayers this morning. Uh, as I pray for us, if you'll pray for me, that God will guide us as he so sees fit um, with accuracy and precision as we unpack this text. Uh, let me pray for us. <clears throat> Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, I ask that you pour out your mercy upon our heads that we might see you for who you are and treasure you above all things. Lord, um, I ask that as we approach uh, your text this morning, not that you give us balance, Lord, but that you give us accuracy and precision. Uh, Lord, I ask that you, uh, by your spirit, through your word, empower me um, to uh, be a vessel, Lord, a conduit through which your word flows and nothing more. Uh, please pour out your mercy upon our heads. Guide us as you so see fit. I pray also for my brothers and sisters in the room that... Um, they too will uh, glean from this text what you would have us see about yourself. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've been with us at Summit for the past year and a half, you'll recall that we've been thus far in the book of Genesis. And more recently, we've not only been in the book of Genesis, we've also been in the story of Joseph. Um, where we've been at in the timeline of Joseph is we are today taking a look at when he's brought back into fellowship with his brothers. Judah, as you recall, has stood before him and stood in, in place of Benjamin, and Joseph is effectively about to reveal himself. But I realize that not everyone has been with us on this journey, and maybe you've been with us on this journey, but you've missed bits and pieces. So I want to bring you up to speed on where we've been thus far in the story of Joseph so that you can appreciate today's moment, because today we're effectively looking at the climax of the Joseph narrative, we're almost even looking at the climax of the Genesis narrative. I mean, it all builds up to this, and so in order to appreciate today's moment, uh, first we've got to walk through a little bit of where we've been thus far in the story of Joseph. Uh, if you know the story of Joseph, either uh, from being here or as a kid, you'll recall that the story of Joseph begins when he, as a young man who is favored by his dad, is given a coat of many colors. And not only does he have dad's favor, but he has these really cool dreams where he presumes that God has given him these dreams where maybe his brothers come and bow down to him. And he goes and he shares it with his brothers. But his brothers already hate him because he has his father's affection. And they hate him now because he has these stupid dreams. And we're told in the text three or four times that they hate, 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 hate Joseph. So one day when he comes out to the field, they say, here comes this dreamer. Let's put an end to the dreams. And what do they do? They strip him of his clothes. They strip him of his coat. They cast him into a pit. And then they talk about... Should we kill him? And how should we kill him? Only for one of them to say, hey, it doesn't benefit us. It doesn't put any money in our pockets if we kill him. So how about we sell him in slavery? And that's exactly what they do. Now, as Joseph is in slavery, he is promoted in Potiphar's house. And it's all really good up until he's falsely accused of sexual harassment and rape by Potiphar's wife, who in turn actually tries to rape him. And we see that he's not only framed, but he's cast into prison. Once he's in prison, he rises to a position of prominence uh, to then interpret the dreams of two guys who are in there with him, only for them to later forget about him, and he feels like he's effectively given a life sentence. The life of Joseph, if you haven't put it together yet, at least thus far, has been very, very, very challenging and very difficult. And we gloss over this thing, but I want to say by the time he gets into Pharaoh's house, I could be off on this, by the time he gets to Pharaoh's house, I could be off on this. I think it's around 20 years, 17 to 20 years, something like that. A crazy amount of time that this man has been subjected to. And we might think, oh, but it's Joseph and he's doing okay. I, we see in Psalm 105, it says that the man was cast into fetters and he was crying aloud. I mean, what we see, the brothers later say, did he not scream and plead for his life when we cast him into the pit? I mean, this guy's life has been absolutely terrible, though by the grace of God, once he's forgotten in the prison, eventually Pharaoh himself has these dreams. Boop. Pharaoh has some dreams. And no one can interpret them. And that's when these two guys, remember Joseph, they bring him up out of the pit. He's able to successfully interpret Pharaoh's dreams. He's put back in a place of prominence, given a coat, not by his father, but by Pharaoh himself. He's given rings on his finger. He's allowed to ride in the chariot beside Pharaoh. And literally, as he rides by, everyone cries out, bow down to the ruler and the Lord of the land. He's put back to a place of prominence only for them to then have his brothers come down and bow down before him as we've seen in some previous chapters. And the dreams that he had back here are now fulfilled here. Crazy story. But that's not all because then at the moment when his brothers come and bow down to him, um, whew, you guys doing all right? 
I'm kind of hoping that you know this story at least from being a kid or something like that because there's a lot of things we're not filling in. But um, there was a famine coming into the region, right? And the whole known world was going to be without food. And so eventually his brothers who were back in the land of Canaan have to come and get food from him as well. And this is what we've taken a look at. Oh, I don't know, you'd probably say the past month. His brothers come to Egypt where Joseph is. And eventually they come before Joseph. They bow down before him and say, sir, can we buy some food off of you? Not recognizing Joseph to be their brothers. And Joseph recognizes them. And he says, you're spies who have come to expose the nakedness of the land. Literally, you've come to sexually assault my land. That's why you're here. So he accuses them of spies to which they respond with the truth. But Joseph still doubles down and says, no, you're spies. And he casts them into prison. Now, eventually, as you guys remember, he comes to him and says, listen, I'll let you out of prison if you go back to your homeland and bring back your youngest brother. I'll give you food to sustain your friends, but I'm sorry, to sustain your family, but I'm going to leave one of you behind so that you still have to come back with your youngest brother. If you guys remember the story, eventually they go back. Dad eventually releases Benjamin. They come back to Egypt only to feel like they're going to be cast into slavery again. if man this is a lot to cover i didn't think about all this you guys doing okay do you remember this is when you were a kid oh i hope so all right um they they feel like they're going to be cast into slavery because on their way back they received food but then they also had their money back in their sacks and so they're relieved when the guy says no your debt has been paid in full you owe me nothing and then all of a sudden joseph throws an entire big feast for them and it's really good up until they head back home with their food when joseph tells his steward to put a cup in the sack of benjamin the youngest son and then send them on their way only to catch up with them and then accuse them of stealing from him And he brings them all back into the palace. You guys doing okay so far? All right. Hopefully you just remember this story because I'm doing a worse job explaining. I think I made it more confusing this way. He comes back. They come back in the presence of Joseph. And Joseph says, why did you steal my cup? What are you doing? Even though Joseph planted it on them all along. And they say, listen, we'll sell ourselves into slavery. You can have us. We see that the brothers have changed tremendously. But Joseph says to him, no, I don't need all of you as slaves. I just need your youngest brother Benjamin, the one who stole the cup, he's going to be my slave forever. And if you were with us last week, you'll recall what Judah did, the most remarkable, one of the most remarkable moments in the book of Genesis. He says, listen, I know that he is allegedly guilty of stealing the cup, but you cannot take him. Instead, take me. Take me in his place and let me pay the debt that is owed by him. Um, That's where we ended last week. The question we ended last week's message with is, how is Joseph going to respond? Thus far, his brothers don't recognize who he is. He recognizes his brothers. He's been messing with this the entire time. And now Judah steps in front of Benjamin. And the question that we have is, how will Joseph respond to this situation? Now, let me ask you one question first. How would you respond in a situation like this? Bear in mind, the last time he had substantial interactions with his brother, they literally stripped him naked, cast him into a pit. Then they started talking about, how should we kill him? Do we hang him? Do we stab him? Do we just send him out into the desert? How should we kill him? No, 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 let's not kill him. Let's sell him to slavery because it's not gonna benefit us if we kill him. Let's put some coin in our pocket. Let's sell him into slavery. Sounds good. And they start a long series for Joseph of nothing but pain. He's sold into slavery, eventually put into prison. This guy's life is terrible. That's the last time they had a substantial interaction with Joseph. And now he is in a position, think about the position that Joseph is in. He literally is second in command of all of Egypt. Literally, he will say in today's text, I'm a father to Pharaoh. I don't, he's not my fault. I don't answer to him. Pharaoh, at the end of the day, answers to me. Pharaoh has put his ring on Joseph's finger. It's basically saying, here's my wallet. Here's my pen to sign contracts with. Anything you do, Joseph, you can have it. He rides in Pharaoh's second chariot. Um, I heard a pastor this week basically saying that Joseph rides in Pharaoh's Bentley. When they go someplace, he rolls up in style. Literally, the people cry out before Joseph, bow before the Lord of Egypt. And people bow down before him. So he's in a place of prominence, overlooking these guys who were absolutely jerks to him that caused him years, decades of pain, and now he's in a position to do something about it. I don't know about you. Um, My question is, how would you respond? And I'll give you an idea of maybe how I would respond. I'd start going through the options. Okay. Um, 
Do I strip them? Do I flog them? Do I just continue to harass them? Do I enslave them like they enslaved me? Do I imprison them like they imprison me? Do I kill them like they talked about killing me? And here's the thing, Joseph, if he were to do any of these things, nobody in Egypt would bat an eye. He has that much power, that much control. We've already seen in previous passages, he just basically says, yeah, put that guy in prison. Nobody asks any questions. He could easily say, yeah, take their heads off, they're spies. And Pharaoh's not gonna say, hey, what went on last Tuesday? Nobody's gonna question this man at all. This is the type of power that he has. This is the type of position he is, he is in. And these are the type of jerks that these guys were to him. How is Joseph going to respond? Well, fortunately for us, the text tells us, if you have your Bibles, this morning we're going to be in Genesis 45, taking a look at how Joseph reacts to his brothers. I'm actually going to take us back to 44, uh, verse 30, and then read through 45, because you need to remember that this is all in response to Judah stepping up on behalf of his younger brother. Let's take a look at the text. 44.30 reads like this. This is Judah, after standing in front of his brother, pleading on behalf of Benjamin that Joseph, who he doesn't know is Joseph, uh, take Judah and Benjamin's stead. It reads like this. Judah says, Now therefore, as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy, that's Benjamin, is not with us, then as my father's life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. Chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So hurry up and go to my father and say to him, thus your son Joseph, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it's my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house that Joseph's brothers had come down, it pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households and come to me, and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of the land of Egypt is all yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes, but to, men, but to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with good things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provisions for his father on the journey. 
Then he sent his brothers away, as, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is the ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and I will see him before I die. The question we have in approaching this text is how in the world is Joseph going to respond to his brothers who stripped him, enslaved him, imprisoned him, and talked about killing him? And what you just see from this text is how does Joseph respond? How did Joseph respond to his brothers? The answer is, unbelievably, graciously, generously, he responded in kindness, he responded in love, he responded in humility, he responded with forgiveness, he responded with mercy. I don't know if you noticed this, but in previous interactions between Joseph and his brothers, we're told that there's an interpreter. Curiously enough, the narrator never tells us in Genesis 44, it never gives break or pause for an interpreter. It's almost in that impassioned plea by Judah, almost, we don't know for sure, but it's almost as in that impassioned plea by Judah last week as we read through what Judah says, that Joseph almost raises his hand to not let the interpreter speak at all, because if you remember, Joseph understands the language of his brothers all along. And so just as the brothers share and Judah steps up in front of Benjamin, you expect Joseph to respond by saying, Aha, it's me, Joseph, and my, oh my, look how the tables have turned. Do you guys remember the dream that you tried to snuff out? Look who's bowing down before me right now. Now take them, now strip them, enslave them, imprison them, kill them. But how does he respond? I think it's fascinating. The very first thing that Joseph does is he says, get everybody out of the room. Which our question is, why is Joseph doing that? Uh, it's my impression that um, Joseph wants an intimate, personal reveal to his brothers. He's not looking for an Instagram moment. He's not looking to make the headlines. He's not looking for TV cameras to be flooded into the room. He sends everybody out. This is between me and my brothers, and I need them to know this is not a show. This is not a ruse. This is not. I need to share with them what God has done in my life. So send everybody out. And as everybody walk, walks out the room, Joseph is weeping so loud. They can hear it in the streets and in the palace beside his own household. It is this, un, just this, this mourning, this weeping, this compassion, this gratitude that just comes out from underneath them to where literally they hear it in Pharaoh's household. What is that noise? And it's Joseph weeping over his brothers and then saying, guys, it's me, Joseph. Is dad still alive? And they're utterly perplexed. Is this some joke? Is this some ruse? What are you talking about? And then Joseph says, what do you say? Come near to me, please. Look in my eyes. T -t Touch my hand. It's Joseph. It's me. And you can imagine in that moment, what would happen in the heart of the brothers who at first, oh wow, cool, it's Joseph. Oh crap, it's Joseph. The last time we had a substantial interaction with this guy, the shoe was on the other foot. There were 10 of us, one of him, and we were able to outnumber him. Now he's got all the land of Egypt that he can pour out upon our heads. We're dead men. But what's the first thing that Joseph says to them after he says, hey guys, it's me, Joseph, and he sees that look in their eyes. He says, no, 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 no. Don't be angry with yourselves and don't be dismayed. You can see Joseph almost getting lower to the guys. It's okay. Don't be upset. And then he goes on to tell them why they should not be upset. You didn't send me here. God sent me here. I'm not angry with you. I'm so glad that you're here. Is dad alive? Come on, talk to me. Fellowship with me. Hear me. See what God has done in our lives. Then he goes on to basically just pour out blessings upon their heads. Here's what's going to happen. Not only am I not going to take your life, I'm going to give you life. I've secured a place for you. You're going to have the best of all of Egypt. I'm not taking your life. I'm giving you life. Guys, God sent me here to bless you. God sent me here to you for this moment right here. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not angry at you. Please talk with me. And eventually the brothers warm up to him. They fall on, on each other's necks. They weep over each other. 
And then Joseph says, hey, um, you got to go get dad. And then he blesses him with a whole ton of stuff. And one of the things that stands out to me, he blesses him with a whole ton of stuff. It's awesome. One of the biggest things that stands out to me is, did you notice what Joseph did? And he's not some vindictive, some vindictive jerk move. He gives each one of them clothing. You strip me of my clothing. I, I don't know that, 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 that even that presentation sounds um, bad, as if Joseph's saying, haha, remember when you strip me of my clothing, now I'm going to give you clothes. No, it's, guys, I'm blessing with clothes. Guys, I know how bad you wanted my multicolored robe. Here's the best of all of Egypt. Go get dad, bring him back here, and tell dad all that God has done. How did Joseph respond? Joseph responded with grace and generosity in an unprecedented way. You see no hint of guilt tripping. You see no shadow or shade of him trying to rub it in on these guys. Don't be angry with yourselves. Don't be dismayed. Let me bless you and look what God has done. So our first question was, how will Joseph respond? Now we've seen how Joseph responded. He responded uh, with grace and generosity. Now my question is, how could Joseph respond this way? I mean, put yourself in his shoes for just a moment. You were a slave and you were a prisoner, all because your brothers hated you and were jealous of you, tossed you in a pit, and sold you for silver. And then when you see them next, you're pouring out blessings upon their heads. My question is, how in the world could Joseph do something like that? Fortunately for us, the man tells us. And take a look at this. He tells us five times in his explanation of everything, of how he's able to do something like this. I'll walk you through it, first revealing its head and verse five. How could Joseph do something like this? Fortunately, he tells us how he could do something like this. In verse five, he says, and now do not be angry or distressed with yourselves because you sold me here. And he tells him why he's not angry, why he's not distressed, why he's not upset. And it's for God sent me before you to preserve life. Okay, now that just might be, you know, a, a nice romantic way of him saying, you know what, God has everything under control and it's all going to be all right, stuff like that. No, 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 no. Joseph doesn't just double down on this thing. He quadruples, quintessently, I, he says it five times. Verse seven, he says to him, now listen to me. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. He goes on in verse eight. So it was not you who sent me here. It was God who sent me here. This is not your doing. This is God's doing. He goes on further eight, in verse 8. He made me a father to Pharaoh. And he made me lord of all of his house. And he made me a ruler over all the land of Egypt. This is not your doing, boys. This is all about God. He continues, lest we be confused. So now hurry up and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. He doesn't say, hey, go home and tell dad everything that you guys did and how I landed in this situation. This is all your fault and this is all the result of your sin. He says, no, 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 go tell dad what God has done, what God has planned, what God has brought to fruition. So my question is, um, how could Joseph respond this way to his brothers? And fortunately, he just told us five times in an explanation. The reason that Joseph could do this the way that he did is he understood and he embraced what is sometimes referred to as the sovereignty of God. He understood, uh, what, what, what do we mean? This is like a $5 church word right here. What do we mean by the sovereignty of God? This is a good working definition. The sovereignty of God basically means this. God is absolutely in control of absolutely everything. The reason why Joseph could be gracious to his brothers in a moment like this is he understands and embraces the sovereignty of God, which is God is in control of absolutely everything, both the good and the bad. To even go a step further, we're not just saying that God knew about all the bad things that were going to happen, and so God ran out ahead and scrambled to put some things in place so that Joseph would be put in the position of power so that when this terrible famine just happens to come and when these stupid brothers just happen to do their dumb sins, God has a plan to catch it over here. That's not what the text says. That's not what the text is talking about. God not only knew, but he sent everything that happened 
both the brother's stupid sin and the giant famine that was going to take everybody out. You say, no, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves right here. We haven't seen anything that talks about God sending this famine. Yes, we have. In Psalm 105.16, look at this. It says, when he, that's referring to the Lord, when he, the Lord, summoned a famine on the land that broke all the supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, who was Joseph, who was sold as a slave. This is saying that the famine didn't just happen as a result of the fall, and God's like, oh, dang it, we should probably do something about that. Let's get Joseph ahead of it. God said, send the famine now. Break the supply of bread right now. It's my call. It's my doing. I send in this famine. Not only is he doing that, he's also sending in the brothers with their stupid sin. And if you didn't already see it reflected in Genesis 45, you'll see it again when Joseph revisits the conversation in Genesis 50, 20, where he literally says to his brothers, as for you, you meant all this evil against me. You intended for evil. You meant for evil. But God meant it for good. You had your intention that started this whole thing. God had his intention that started this whole thing that it would bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What we're seeing in today's text is the reason why Joseph can have the response that he does to his brothers is because he understands and embraces the sovereignty of God defined roughly as God is absolutely in control of absolutely everything, both the good things and the bad things. The good things and the bad things. Now, what is this in contrast to um, well, no, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say it this. This is not a verse. This is something I heard actually by Johnny Erickson Tata, if you're familiar with her. Um, a paraplegic, if I'm not mistaken, who has started an incredible ministry of serving those who have been affected by um, disabilities. This is a part of her testimony. When I heard her trying to account for why God in a diving accident allowed her be- to become a paraplegic, and she says this, quoting a friend, God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. What we're seeing in this whole situation with Joseph is God will permit what he hates, the sin of the brothers, the famine coming in, he will permit what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Let me give you other biblical words you can use for the word permits right here. This means that God allows what he hates. This means that God predestines what he hates. This means that God sends what he hates. This means God initiates what he hates. This means that God enables what he hates to accomplish what he loves, all while at the exact same time remaining holy, remaining pure, remaining perfect, remaining righteous, and not acquitting those who were guilty. So what Joseph is not doing here is he's not saying, hey guys, the sin that you did to me is not actually a sin because God had these intentions of these things rolling out. He's saying, no, 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 that was sin, and by all means you're guilty of that sin. But here's the thing, though your sin is against God, it is never over God. He is sovereign and supreme over absolutely everything. There is nothing that goes on, good or bad, anything against him that is ever over him. He is sovereign and supreme over everything, including the stupid sin and your jealousy that cast me into the pit. But God had plans that supersede your plans, even in your stupidity. God can and will redeem anything. He is sovereign over all things. God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. By all means, that was sin, and you're guilty for it. But God, in his redemptive kindness, he basically says to his brothers, as we've said before, guys, you are not half as bad as God is good. You will never outdo him in your folly. His wisdom is far too superior. And that's why Joseph can have the response that he has to his brothers. Please understand, this is not saying that God just happens to know that these things were going to happen, and then he ran out ahead to try and create a system to catch it. It says that God knew it from the beginning, that God permitted it from the beginning. He allowed it, he predestined it, he sent it, he initiated it, he enabled it. He said, this is going to happen, and I've got a plan that's going to redeem all the sin that these guys put into place. I will eventually redeem it, and I will save it. Now, you may say, um, uh, okay, I'll grant you that for this one particular occasion in Scripture. This is a really cool, miraculous story where God decides to um, intervene and supersede and get involved. Uh, But this is just an anomaly. This is the story of Joseph. This is a story in the Bible. God doesn't do this everywhere. I'm so sorry. You have to understand. This is the common thread throughout the Bible. 
This is the norm in the Bible, not the abnormal. And if it's normal for the Bible, it's normal for all of us. It's not just saying that God intervened to this one super special occasion. It's that God intervenes in all occasions. Occasions don't happen without God. I'll give you an idea of what I mean just by taking us through a few different passages of scripture. Um, in Exodus 4, you guys know this passage, we're told that God is the one who hardens Pharaoh's heart. It's not that Exodus rolls around and there's a really mean Pharaoh and God says, oh my gosh, I had no idea there was gonna be a really mean Pharaoh. What am I gonna do to redeem the people of Israel? God said, no, 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 Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's head, Pharaoh's actions and hands are not above my heart, my head, my actions and my plans. I'm hardening that man's heart. That's the only reason that that thing comes about. Uh, this isn't even in my slides here, but you remember back to Genesis 15. What does he say to Abraham? Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be enslaved in a land not their own for 400 years. And then I will bring them out into the promised land to conquer the Amorites because the wickedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. Basically what he's saying is, I know that you're going to be enslaved. It's a part of my plan that you'll be enslaved. And when I bring you out of slavery, you're going to crush another people over here because their sin has not yet come to full fruition. It hasn't revealed its entire ugly head. So I'm going to give them time to reveal who they are so that when I come in with my justice, everyone will look at me and say, God, you were justified for doing what you did. I'm telling you, this is some crazy stuff. It is all throughout your Bible. Exodus 4, not only do you see God hardening Pharaoh's heart, which maybe has to do with moral bad things, but we also see that, if you remember in this conversation, God even associates with, um, I'm going to say, or claims sovereignty over non-moral bad things. Do you remember what Moses says in this whole thing? God, I can't go and talk to Pharaoh. I, listen, I, don't, I stutter when I talk. I have a slight lisp. He's not going to listen to me. What does God say? Who made man's mouth? And then God says this, who made man mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? I mean, do you realize God is saying, listen, I make people blind. I make people speak. I make people deaf, which is different than what we think. Oftentimes we think, oh, this is just a result of the fall, some random chaos that God wasn't in control of, but one day he's going to redeem it. God's saying, no, 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 that's me and that's my hand. Even the things that are against me are not over me. I'm sovereign. This is a part of my plan. You guys track it with me? These are just a few verses we'll just walk through. In Exodus 4, yeah, we see that he does that. In Job 1, if you've ever read the first chapter of Job, what do you see? It's God who initiates a conversation with Satan about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? Look at how he praises me. Well, he only praises you because you give him stuff. Really? You think so? Go mess with him if you want to. Just don't touch his body. And how does Satan respond? Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Not a problem, sir. And he goes and he does it. We see that God has no problem talking about being over the things that are against him. God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. This is not an anomaly. In Proverbs 16, 4, look at this. It says, the Lord has made everything for his purpose. That's the verse. The Lord has made everything for his purpose. And you, and that, so that means everything. That means bad things. Now you might think, well, okay, well, in this verse, it's a proverb, and we don't know if that it really means bad things. Take a look at how the verse ends. Even the wicked for the day of trouble. That means God has his purpose even for bad things, even for wicked things. He has purposed them from the very beginning, specifically that the wicked would be consumed by the day of trouble. Um, in John 6, uh, we see that, what does Judas say? Did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Je Jesus is saying, I went out there and I picked you guys. I'm not just knowing, but wanting Judas to be a devil who would betray me. In John 12, have you ever seen this? This is crazy. A pastor pointed this out to me one time. He comes up to Judas and he gives him the bread, you know, just before Judas is going to betray him. And he says to Judas, what you're going to do, do quickly. Do you realize that's a command from God? And Judas effectively says, yes, sir. Sorry, sir. I'm on my way out, sir. It's he has command over the one who is quite literally betraying him. It's not Jesus over here like, I had no idea somebody was gonna betray me. It's like, no, it's Judas. I brought him in from the very beginning and now I send him out, go do what, go do what you're supposed to do. In Acts 4, 27, 28, if you think this is all like, oh, a made up ruse, just consider this one verse right here. This is, I think it's Peter, I could be off. Um, and he's talking to the people and he's saying, for truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and along with the peoples of Israel. So Lord, in the, uh, he's saying to the people, in this city were wicked people going against the hand of God, the Gentiles who uh, eventually crucified him, the Jews who gave him up, the leaders who were involved in the whole conversation. They're the ones who are guilty of sin, of killing Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, to do 
whatever your hand, the Lord, and your plan had predestined to take place. What these verses are going on to showcase for us is it's not that God just is caught off guard when these things happen. It's not that God just happens to know about them and he runs ahead of them and just happens to scramble to get some things in place to be able to catch people when they fall. It's God is saying, from the very beginning, you need to understand, I am sovereign and supreme over absolutely everything, not just the good things, not just the neutral things, not just the random things. I'm sovereign over all things, including the things that are absolutely antithetical and opposed to who I am. Nothing is beyond me. Nothing is over me. I'm God. I'm sovereign. I'm supreme. We bring this up because that is the reason why Joseph can turn to his brothers and say, guys, I don't hold any animosity to you. Because though you had a stupid, silly, jealous plan to hurt me, to bring about evil, God through those actions was going to bring about good, to bring about this very moment of me and of him saving all of our lives, not just yours, but the entire known world. So don't be angry with yourselves. What we see from this text is it's talking about how God is sovereign over absolutely everything. Um, Real quick, I'll address some questions or comments we might have on the sovereignty of God. We may think something to the effect of, um, does this mean that um, because God is sovereign over good things and bad things, um, that, and because he's in control of everything, uh, that if I do bad, I mean... This is all part of God's plan. This is all part of his, um, I mean, he knew it was going to come. He initiated its bringing about, if you will. Uh, He predestined this to happen, even with my sin, their sin. And so therefore, I'm not guilty for it. And I can't be held responsible for it. um, Because this is all, it's all going part of God's plan. Effectively, what we're saying is because um, God is in control, I can't be held accountable for where I've been out of control. Does this make sense? You, you maybe have heard this objection. It's the most common, one of the most common objections to the sovereignty of God. Uh, if that's you, I'll draw your attention to a movie scene that I've quoted you before that's just phenomenal uh, that helps address this point. It's in the Dark Knight. This is the Batman movie with Heath Ledger where he plays the Joker. Put a smile on that face situation. You know? There's a scene in that movie where, if you don't know Batman, this won't make any sense, but if you know a little bit, it'll be okay. Um, <clears throat> One time I was watching a Batman movie with Jenna, and she was like, why has he got pointy ears, and why does he fly around, and what's he doing in a cave, and all this stuff. I'm like, do you know anything about Batman? She's like, I know a lot about Batman. I was like, what's Batman's real name? And what did she say? She said, Clark Kent. I was like, oh gosh, no. No, first of all, it's Clark Kent, and that's Superman, and this is Batman. And Batman, we all know, is Bruce Wayne. We know it, but the people in Gotham don't know that Bruce Wayne is Batman, right? But in the movie The Dark Knight, there's a scene where one of the accountants who works for Bruce Wayne, who happens to be a billionaire during the day, and Batman at night, and nobody is able to connect the two except for like two people. One of them is named, I think, Mr. Fox. And anyway, this accountant comes in, he sits down with Mr. Fox, he says, I've been running, I've been doing some math, and our accounts don't add up. And when I investigated, I realized the reason our accounts don't add up is because uh, Wayne Industries is sponsoring Batman, because it basically says, because now I know that Bruce Wayne is Batman. And the guy's just looking at him, and he basically says, here's what I want. I want a million dollars in my bank account every single month, and if I don't get it, I'm gonna tell the whole world who Bruce Wayne really is, who's the Batman. I'm blackmailing Give me money, and I won't give his identity. And Morgan Freeman, who plays Mr. Fox, turns back to the man, he says, "Um, so let me get this straight. You happen to know the identity of a masked vigilante who um, has unlimited resources and can snatch people up off the street at any given moment, hide their body, and nobody can ever find it. And you, you good sir, you want to blackmail that guy? And if you've seen this scene, you just see the accountant realize all of a sudden what he's done and what he said, and he shrinks back in his seat. He apologizes and he excuses himself from the room never to give off the identity of Bruce Wayne or Batman because he realizes um, in attempting to 
<laughs> how do I put this? When he, went, when he actually put two and two together on what the character of Batman was, he realized to go against a man who was so powerful, so supreme, so sovereign, was absolutely foolish. So here's what I'll say to you. If you hear about the sovereign description of God's character, and you use that against the sovereign decree of God on how you ought to be conducting your character, and if you say, well, because you're this, I'm not gonna do this, I would just advise you, you do not understand the sovereignty of God, and you ought to be shrinking back in your seat in utter terror that you thought about blackmailing the Lord God of the universe, who is absolutely in control of everything. Your heart will beat in five seconds because he allows it and because he wants it. Try going against that man. We do not take a look at the sovereign description of God and then decide to go against the sovereign decree. Rather, what we do is we say this, God, you are sovereign. God, you are absolutely in control of everything. Therefore, I will control myself accordingly. Does this make sense? That is the proper response to the sovereignty of God. It is to say, God is, God is sovereign, and therefore, I will respond responsibly to his sovereignty, not pitting his sovereignty against himself. That's what Joseph is doing. I don't know if you noticed this, but the reason why Joseph is able to not only handle his suffering, but also his success, is because he understands the sovereignty of God. When I was in the pit, I was in the pit because God wanted me there. And therefore, if he wants me there, he's here with me because he's in charge of absolutely everything. But not only that, not only does that comfort him of this is where God wants me, and yes, it hurts like hell, but God is right here with me holding my hand. This is a part of his perfect plan. The alternative to that is God doesn't know what's going on, and God, I hope that somebody figures it out before I die in this pit. Not comforting, not encouraging, not what Joseph was thinking, not what got him through the pit, not what will get you through the pit either. God is here, God is sovereign, God knows that I'm here, he holds my hand, I cling to him. But not only does that inform Joseph's suffering in the pit, that also informs uh, Joseph's success in the palace. I had a preacher point this out this week. Um, the most scary part of Joseph's life is not when he's in the pit, not when he's in prison. It's when he's in the palace. And he is given unlimited power. Because we know what power typically does, it corrupts. Think of David, uh, once he finally becomes king, that's when all of a sudden he goes out on the rooftop and he starts checking out Bathsheba. I got power, who's gonna question me? And no, Joseph understands the sovereignty of God. He's not only with me and in control of everything when I'm in the pit and when I'm in the prison, he's in control of everything when I'm in the palace and therefore I'm going to respond appropriately, which means I'm going to respond to my brothers, not in vengeance, not in agitation, not in frustration, not in revenge over them, but I'm going to respond because God in control of this situation right now, I'm going to respond as he would call me to respond, which is grace, love, and mercy for these guys. All because he understands the sovereignty of God. In just a minute, we're going to turn and take a look at how this might affect our lives. But there's one last question um, that comes to mind for some people, which is, okay, maybe this is bad, biblically backed up. Yes, I could see it in the text. And if you look into this, this rationally makes sense. This logically makes sense. Um, but you might look at this and say, this makes me incredibly uncomfortable. That God is in control of all things, both good things and bad things. This makes me incredibly uncomfortable. Here's my encouragement to you. In almost every time I see the sovereignty of God talked about in scripture, it is typically done in a context like this one, where someone is comforting another person. Whether it's Paul comforting us, whether it's John comforting us, whether it's Joseph comforting his brothers, generally speaking, the sovereignty of God is only taught about in the context of trying to comfort someone. Which means this, if you see this doctrine, this character and attribute of God, and you're not comforted by it, it means you're not yet seeing it correctly. So my encouragement to you would be, hold tight, see that it's true, see that it's talked about in scripture, cling to it in order that the Lord might open up your eyes to see it correctly. And when you see it correctly, you will not be scared or intimidated or angry with God. You will be comforted by God. A lot of us, myself included, when we see this doctrine first talked about, it's like all of a sudden we thought that we were like, I don't know, out in a field by ourselves, you know, just doing the things that we do out in the field. I don't know what you do in the field. And it's all of a sudden when we start to see this, we're like, oh man, this means I'm not alone because 
God's over there. And this means I'm not alone because, oh no, God's over there. Over there, over there, over there, over there. And all of a sudden it feels like we're surrounded and that can be very, very scary if you thought you were alone in a field and all of a sudden you're surrounded by anything else, let alone the character of God who is as supreme and as amazing as he is. And that can be very, very scary until one, but it can be very scary if you're not aligned with him. Oh, it can be very, very scary. Um, But when you realize, when you align yourself with him, and then you realize that when you're aligned with him, that presence around you is not against you, but it is for you, it is the most comforting thing in the entire world. Which is why Joseph can look at his brothers throughout the crappiest situations that have probably ever happened to a single individual, and he can look at them and say, guys, I got nothing but kindness, grace, and mercy to pour out upon your head. He was operating from a position of being comforted by the sovereignty of God. If you're not yet being comforted by the sovereignty of God, you don't yet see it correctly. My only encouragement to you is do not chuck it out because it scares you. Cling to it and come to the Lord and say, what you would demand of me, I ask that you provide for me. If this is who you are and what your character is all about, I ask that by the grace of God, you give me the perspective to see it accurately, rightly, and true. And when you see it accurately, rightly, and true, you'll be comforted by it at the end of the day. I hope you can see it's biblical. Um, And I hope you can, like Joseph, come to a place where you not only understand it and you mentally acquiesce to it, but when you are comforted by it. And on the darkest day of your life, on the dark day of your soul, this will be the warmth that God uses to comfort you. Because this is how he comforts people in scripture all the time when they're scared. The sovereignty of God and the security of God are equivocated in scripture. If you don't have one, you don't have the other. Get to know the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> so that's how Joseph could comfort his brothers. He understood and he embraced the sovereignty of God. That even the things that go against God, God is still over. God permits even the things that he hates to accomplish the things that he loves. Now our question is, um, how can I respond this way? Um, How can I respond in times of suffering and in times of success with a cool, calm, and collected hand? How can I do what this Joseph guy did, which is um, forgive his brothers, which is withstand the pit, withstand the prison, withstand the pursuits of Potiphar's wife trying to solicit him. The whole thing that Joseph is couching this up to is God is in control and I'll trust him. So how do I get to a place like that? And the encouragement from the text is this. You have to, have to, have to. You don't have to know this to be a believer. You have to know this to become a mature believer. You must embrace the sovereignty of God. You have to not only see it as true, You have to embrace it as true. And when you do, it will be the greatest comfort to you. You know, one of the things I think is interesting in this text, I have a general tendency to be able to, I think this is right, accurate, and true. My wife could tell you if I'm off on this. Um, But I have a general tendency to forgive people. I mean, I haven't been ever all that significantly wronged, right? I mean, it's never, you know, never had anything as crazy as Joseph's thing. But I can forgive other people. You know who I have the hardest time forgiving? Myself. And do you realize what Joseph is doing here with his brothers? That's actually the thing he's wanting to speak to. He's saying, I know you want to be angry right now. And he's saying, I know you want to be angry with yourselves. You want to hate yourselves. You want to operate in unforgiveness towards yourself. You want to punish yourself. You want to bring out the whip and you want to slap yourself in the back. You want punishment. You want hatred. But you don't understand yet the sovereignty of God, which means this. Every time Dave is trying to punish himself, it's because I don't understand the sovereignty of God that when I finally stand face to face, I've always imagined it would be this. I'd stand face to face to God and I'd say, look, God, I am so sorry for all the sin that I've done against you. I'm so sorry that I and humanity, that we, that we killed you, that we rejected you, that we hated you. I, and I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be inching towards the back door saying, so I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't deserve to see your face. I am so sorry. And do you not realize what we see in scripture is that God is going to have the same reaction to you that Joseph is having with his brothers. 
where God is coming down and saying, yes, it was sin. Yes, it was wrong. Yes, you were selfish. You were jealous. You were stupid. Yes, you were utterly evil. But do you not know that I intended, you intended this for evil, but I intended this for good. I mean, do you not realize before the foundations of the earth, God said to his son, son, you're going to go down and die for them. You're going to pay for their sin. We're going to orchestrate this entire thing to where they're going to stab us in the back only so that we can turn around and bless them and call them friends of God, children of God, despite the fact that they were enemies of God. We're told in scripture, it was for the joy set before him that Christ went to the cross. I oftentimes think Jesus is saying, oh, stupid Dave, he sinned again. I got to go die on the cross for him. He's saying, no, 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 Dave sinned for me. Now, Dave, watch me. Die on your behalf. Have the wrath of God poured out on my soul so that it doesn't have to be poured out on your soul. It is for the joy of my father's face and bringing you into the family that gladly I'll die. What did Jesus say to Peter when Peter tried to stop him from going to the cross? That's the only time he ever refers to one of his disciples as Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking the thoughts of the enemy, not the thoughts of God. I will gladly go and die for my people. When you get to heaven, it will not be God saying, Whew, did you see this sin? Did you see this sin? Did you see this sin? Man, I had to really pay for that one. He's going to say, enter into my kingdom and marvel at my gracious and generous sovereign hand, which has provided all of this for you. He's going to have, if you were with us last week, we said in Genesis 44, Judah looks a lot like the son of God. But what you're supposed to see in Genesis 45 is Joseph looks a lot like the Father God, who's saying, listen, I know you intended this for evil, but I intended this for good, in order that you might see the glorious nature of my supreme, righteous, holy, beautiful character. Look at what I've done on your behalf. And when that clicks in your soul, when you embrace that and wrap your arms around it, It will empower you to be like Joseph, whether you're in suffering or whether you're in success, whether you're dealing with the sins of others or the sins of yourself, that God is sovereign and in control of absolutely everything. And everything will ultimately glorify him inevitably. And when you see that, it will be the greatest, when I see that, it will be the greatest comfort to our souls. That is, from what I can tell, Uh, one of the major points in Genesis 45. How could Joseph respond in a way like this? He understood the sovereignty of God. How will you be able to respond to life? I'm talking today, I'm talking Sunday afternoon, Monday morning, Monday night, three years from now when you get the worst news possible. The only way you'll be able to handle it as Joseph is handling life is when you understand and embrace the sovereignty of God. What we have intended for evil, God has intended for good. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to praise God because he's praiseworthy. <clears throat> Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, in any way that I misrepresented your character, I ask for forgiveness, Lord. And I brought comfort by your word that says, let God be true, though every man a liar. And Lord, though I have no intention, though I'm not aware of any time in which I overstepped or misspoke, I ask, Lord, that if that was the case, that you... Um, that you be glorified through it, as I know you inevitably will be. Lord, we ask as we approach the end of Genesis, the, the book, quite literally the foundational book that establishes who you are, that we might understand that nothing is beyond you. And though things are against you, they are never over you. They are all working and operating consistent with your perfect plan, even though they try to go against your plan, they will end up fulfilling it. Lord, um, empower us to remember that uh, we are only half as bad as you are good. There's nothing that you cannot save, nothing that you cannot remedy. Empower us to understand that when the enemy comes to sow seeds of, of destruction, that you only ever give him enough rope to hang himself. Your purposes will not be thwarted We are not in position as human beings to say, what have you done? For our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. So Lord, we just ask that you impress this text upon us, impress your character and your spirit upon us, that we might see you for who you are, treasure you above all things, and do what we've been designed to do, which is to reflect your character back to yourself, which is exactly what we see Joseph doing here in this story. 
So Lord, for those of us in the room who have issues with forgiveness of others or ourselves, may we see that uh, the sins done by us or against us are not beyond your plan in a general sense, Lord, and are not above your sovereignty and beyond your hand, but that you have a plan and an intention for them to ultimately glorify yourself and to bless those who are your children who are following after your name. So God, I just ask that you pour out these things upon our heads that we might see you, taste you, trust you, treasure you above all things and in all ways. And whatever situation we find ourselves in this week, suffering or success, probably both, we ask that you empower us by your spirit to remember the sovereignty of God and let that be a comfort to our souls. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.